Okay everyone, welcome to part 6 of the Terminator build series. I'm going to break this part into two pieces because it's going to be fairly long. So this is going to be part A of part 6 of the first half. Um, let's jump right into this and try and make it as quick as possible without going too long. Um, the first thing you want to do is turn on your printer. Uh, make sure that your USB cord and your HDMI cord are plugged into the printer. Obviously you're going to need a computer with an HDMI output on it um, and obviously a USB port as well. So go ahead and plug in your USB port and your HDMI to your computer. Make sure the computer is already running, of course. Um, and we're this example is going to be with Windows 10 because that's what's on the computer I'm using to print right now. Um, Windows 10 has a lot of problems, so we'll get into that in a second. But if you're using Windows 7, you can skip some of these steps because a lot of it just has to do with Windows 10 and some of the really poor software choices Microsoft made. So let's get right into it here. Um, after you've plugged it in, you're going to bring up your settings panel and you're going to go to your display settings. And then right here you see we've got screen 1 and 2. And when you scroll down here, you want to see uh, you want to see this resolution here as 2048 by 1536 for the iPad screen. And notice I have number two selected. If I click on one, that's the resolution for the laptop. So that's screen one. When we click on screen two, that's how we see the settings down here for screen two. So you're not going to see this resolution here because Windows 10 doesn't support this resolution natively. So this is the first obstacle to get over in order to make this work. So the first thing we're going to do is actually, after we pull this up and make sure that Windows has recognized the display is plugged in, then we're going to start up um, the Intel Graphic Control Panel. Um, if you have a Intel-based uh, CPU, I, I'm running this on a Intel i7, which has built-in uh, graphics, and this is how you add custom resolutions, they call it, to Windows 10. There's no way to add the resolutions through the Windows menus. A uh, quick disclaimer here, we're going to show you how to basically do some custom stuff to Windows 10 and do some little shortcuts and hacks to keep Windows 10 from doing some stupid things. So you're fully responsible if you mess up your computer. So let's get right into this. Um, the first thing we're going to do is click on uh, multiple displays here. Make sure it shows two of them. And then see right here, make sure this says to extend. We don't want to clone all of our icons from desktop one which would be our screen over to the printer because if we do that it's going to print icons into our resin instead of our print so make sure you have it set to extend which basically means that screen 2 over here to the right which is the printer will be a blank desktop um, and then right here you're going to select primary as number one which is your screen of your, your your main screen for your computer and then number two will show up as a digital television monitor which will be our printer so now we need to go add our resolution so that it's the correct resolution. So you're going to click on custom resolutions. This is going to say warning, do you want to milk your computer if you're an idiot? And you're going to say yes. And then you're going to go in here and just make sure you have add selected up here because remove will remove profiles. So make sure you click add. And you're going to type in your width here. So 2048. Your height is going to be 1536. And the refresh rate here is going to be 50 hertz for the iPad screen. <clears throat> and the underscan, you can just leave this under underscan alone. So just take a quick glance here at the bottom, make sure this is what you wanted. And then you're going to click add over here, and it's going to add it to your custom resolutions in Windows. Um, and if you notice, if we click on this right here, if we were to click add right now, this is going to add this profile to our built-in display, which we don't want because our built-in display doesn't support this resolution anyway. So make sure and pull this drop down and select your digital television monitor, which is our other screen or the printer. And then you can see I already have a custom resolution list here 
and the 2048 by 1536 at 50 hertz is already saved in here because I've already saved this and run the printer before. So you can see everything's in here. Um, interlaced is disabled. We do not want to interlace. Um, we just want a progressive signal. Interlacing would be for older TVs and stuff like that. So make sure you have the correct display selected here when you add the custom resolution. Um, and that's pretty much it. Once you get this done, then when you pull up the window settings again, and you click on monitor 2, you're going to scroll down here. When you click on this resolution drop down, you're going to see your new one that you added at the top, and that'll be the correct aspect ratio and everything for the printer to work correctly. Alrighty, and then the other settings we're going to change as well, or, or verify that they're correct, is we're going to make sure that the icons and stuff like that don't go over to the other display. So just go down here and make sure the orientation set to landscape. Um, make sure that even though we set this in the other settings panel for Intel, make sure that this is set to extend. If you have this show only on one or only on two, um, it could cause problems. If you say duplicate, you're going to get your icons over on the printer, which you don't want. I haven't tried this yet, only one or only two. But I think if you show the desktop only on one, I don't know if it will allow the printer program to send the signal over to two. So I just have it set to extend. So the other thing we want to double check really quick is make sure that the taskbar does not um, appear on screen two because that's our printer and we'll end up wasting resin because the taskbar obviously is going to show up as a bright area of the screen and start curing resin. So just search for taskbar here really quick. Um, we've set the taskbar to auto hide, um, and then down here, uh, down here at the bottom where, where it says show taskbar on all displays, we've turned this off because otherwise this taskbar down here is going to extend over onto the printer. So just make sure this is off. That way you don't get a taskbar on the printer. Um, show contacts, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So that's the main parts of the window settings to get the printer screen working so you don't have any drama or problems later. Um, go back to here. So at this point, you should have a printer screen that's the correct aspect ratio. It should have the correct resolution. There should be no icons over there. Um, there should be nothing over there, no taskbar. So when you turn the printer on and have it plugged in at this point, you should be able to look at the screen on the printer and it should look exactly like your desktop minus everything else. So basically you're going to see the desktop background, the screen, and I have mine set to black right now for, for a certain reason. But you should basically see whatever your wallpaper is over on the printer and it should be the correct aspect ratio and all that good stuff. So I have set mine to black and the reason I did that is because the print failed because Windows 10 popped up a notification down here on the taskbar. Let me close this real quick. Windows 10 popped up a notification down here, and the way Windows 10 works is when an application pops a notification, it takes control of the active app, which means that if you have an app running and it's sending a signal over to screen 2, Windows basically moves that program over to screen 1 because screen 1 is your active screen when the, when the notification pops up. And it moved my print window from the printer over into my desktop. It cured basically the entire bottom of the vat and wasted a bunch of my resin because the desktop background was a color. So from now on when I do printing, I just change the desktop background to black real quick. And that way if something goes terribly wrong and the window moves over here, nothing happens. The print just stops because the printer screen will be black. So, so the next thing we want to show you is how to keep Windows 10 from rebooting because Windows 10 is super annoying. And Microsoft purposely, purposely designed it to reboot whenever it wants to or thinks it's a good idea. And there are settings in the update and notifications and reboot settings and power settings where you can basically tell Windows 10, I don't want you to reboot unless it's outside of my active hours. So let's say your active hours are from 9 in the morning till 5 in the evening, right? So you should be good to go. Well, with Windows 10, wrong because once again, Microsoft is making some really whack software. I don't know why they call it an operating system, but 
essentially, if you walk away from your computer and you have it set to, nev to never reboot or update and restart during active hours, let's say it's noon and you walk away from your computer to go eat lunch. The system notices that your mouse isn't moving and that you're not doing anything. So it says, oh, he's not here. So even though the active hours are active, we're going to reboot anyway. So if it decides to download an update and reboot the system, guess what? Anything you have running will get crashed. So if you have a 3D print running, it will crash your 3D print, and it'll reboot the computer right in the middle of your print, which is super annoying for anyone using any kind of rendering software, printing software. You could think of all the host of different software, CNC machines, anything you could possibly run from an operating system, especially a laptop. Um, so I'm I'm going to show you guys uh, Tech Journey right here. You can look at the address up here. This is how to permanently basically hack Windows 10 so it cannot reboot on its own. And what this does is it doesn't harm the way Windows updates. It just keeps Windows from auto rebooting and installing the update. So if you want to reboot the computer on your own so that, a, so that an update can install, you can. Um, nothing's going to happen. But if you walk away from your computer and, you're, and some program is running, Windows will not be able to reboot itself. Um, so basically what they do is they go into here to the task scheduler and they disable it. But then the problem is Windows goes and they even note right here. Um, Windows 10 is sneaky and it goes and it basically changes the permissions and re-enables the reboot task so that it can reboot whenever it wants to. Um, so note this folder here, Windows System 32 Task Microsoft Windows Update Orchestrator. That's where you're going to be looking at. Um, they say to go in here and change the permissions and basically lock the system out and apply it only to yourself. I never did this. I did the alternative down here, which is to rename the reboot file. Um, so when you find, when you go to this um, path they show right here in Windows 10, all I did was go in here and you can just rename this file, uh, reboot, this reboot file just name it reboot.old and what that does is it tells compute it tells windows that it's an obsolete old file not to use it and then right click in that same location and just create a folder and name the folder capital r reboot like this and so what happens is windows 10 when it tries to auto reboot it basically just opens the folder up and does nothing because it's a folder it's not a program the folder's empty so that gets around uh, Microsoft and their annoying operating systems, or so they call it. Okay, so by this point, we should have gotten the printer screen working, um, verified that the icons and desktop are not going to go over there, no taskbar, and we've also disabled um, the Windows automatic reboot. And you also want to go and make sure that sometimes, if you're using a laptop, which I am, sometimes when you close the lid on the laptop, um, it auto sleeps the system and you also want to make sure and disable any screen savers and sleeping options like that so make sure your screen saver is disabled if you have one make sure your system is set to never sleep even when it's on battery power um, because if you forget to plug in your power to the laptop and you're running on battery while you're printing and you walk away for 20 minutes the system will auto sleep to avoid killing the battery but it will also kill your print so Make sure your computer cannot sleep on its own. And then we're going to get on here to the next part, um, which is the software I'm using. So the resin I use is from a UK company called Photocentric. Um, they're the ones that specialize in most of the daylight resins available to the public right now. And they sell this software called Photocentric Studio. And it's basically printer slicing software specifically made for SLA printers um, but it also gives you the option to set up all your supports and stuff like that. It has really good options for using um, different kinds of supports and that's why I'm using this software. Um, it is not free but I've tried a lot of free softwares out there for generating supports because supports are the most one of the most crucial parts for SLA prints. If the supports are not designed right or they're not robust enough, or they're, or they're not placed in the correct places, um, your prints will fail. So you could have the best printer in the world, and if you don't have the correct supports and slicing software, it's not going to successfully print no matter what. So I eventually decided 
not to try and use the free software because they all had glitches or missing features and I eventually just decided to buy Photocentric Studio. And uh, I'm not being paid by Photocentric to put this up or anything, but it's just my opinion um, as far as the quality of the software. Um, they do give you two perpetual licenses, um, so it's not like the American companies where they rob you by the month. Uh, pay as you go, pay for the rest of your life as long as the software is on your computer type of deal. So this is really nice. You get two licenses that can be used forever, and you can use it on two PCs. So that's a big plus for me if I'm going to buy a piece of software. Um, and the price down here is 230 So if you're purchasing this in the U.S., it's going to be $230. My opinion, it's worth it. Um, some people might say, oh, that's a lot of money. That's really steep. But like I was saying earlier, when you really understand how important the slicing and the supports are to the success of your prints, I think it's a, a worthy investment, especially if you already spent almost $1,000 building the printer or purchasing a printer. Um, having good software to make sure your prints are successful is, in my opinion, worth this amount. But they do have a 30-day trial here um, for free. So if you'd like to download it and try it, by all means, do so. See what you think of the software. Um, I'm basically going to give a tutorial on the software because that's the software I'll be using to show how to prepare the prints. So you'll kind of get to see how to use it. Um, but let's jump right in here and see how to use it now that you've seen this. Um, the only thing I would say is if you do download the trial version, make sure that the printer is fully functioning physically first because this 30-day clock starts ticking the moment you install the program and start it up. So even if you're not using it for a week, you lost seven days worth of your trial. So make sure you're really ready to go and you have hardware that's working before you uh, start using the trial. So um, this is the support page um, for their photocentric software. And if you guys have questions that I don't go over for some reason in the video, you can check in here and see if they're in here. It kind of shows the basics of how to install it, but we're going to go into a little more detail when we actually uh, use it. So let's go ahead and show you guys how to use it. So once again, um, we're using Windows 10. Um, as you guys know, I love Windows 10 so much. And Windows 10, another lovely feature of Windows 10 is it um, tries to scale things so that they're larger on the screen. And since this is a fairly high resolution screen, 1920 by 1080, it tries to make them bigger so they're easier to see. But the problem is it does a horrible job of it, and it makes them all blurry. I don't understand how their scaling ag algorithm could be so horrible, because every photo program I've ever used has no problem scaling things up and down without making them blurry. But leave it to Microsoft to screw it up. So um, when you start up Photocentric Studio, the program's going to be super blurry if you don't set this one option because it tries to scale all of the graphics in the program. So you're going to right click on the icon, you're going to click on properties, and you're going to get this little panel. You're going to click on compatibility, and you're going to go down here to change high DPI settings. You're going to click on this, and you're going to notice down here, um, this should be off. Make sure down here where it says override high DPI scaling behavior. You're going to click that, which is basically going to override the system scaling that's trying to help you see everything, and just set this to application. So that way, the application itself will determine what the scale is, which is what we want. So click OK, OK, and you're going to have to click Apply there. I didn't show that, but click Apply and then OK. Um, and then we're going to just start up the software. So let's start it up here. Um, the first thing we're going to do is select our machine. Now, the machine we built, or the Terminator machine I built, is going to be the most similar to the HR2, because this printer that Photocentric sells also uses the same resolution display as the iPad. Um, and my profile that I'm going to use for the resin is going to be the hard resin 50 microns, because that's where I've saved all of my support um, profiles and stuff. So I'm just going to select that and hit Apply. If you ever want to check which profile you have active while the program is open, just look up here in the corner. This is the printer you have active, and this is the resin profile you have active. And all of your support profiles are saved in this resin profile. So if you were to change this to a resin profile you never used before and then go generate supports, your supports will be um, different because your profile you saved is not, is not in that profile. So it's kind of like a sub-profile. It's a little confusing, but... 
anyway, um, we're going to use uh, Halo Grunts as an example. Um, I'm going to show you guys the link below for the model I downloaded on Thingiverse. But I'm going to go ahead and import one of the grunts here. I click import. Um, let's just import this guy because he's the most simple. Now if you'll notice, he looks super, super tiny there. I don't know why the scale was off, but we're going to hit this. This is the scale button up here. Scale it up by a factor of 10 in all directions. Apply. And now here's our halo grunt at the quick scale we want to print him. He comes out about 35 or 40 millimeters tall, I think. I um, don't remember the exact scale, but this is actually fairly small. He looks fairly large in the view, but if you consider how big this screen is right here, um, he's pretty small. So anyway, um, I did take the file from the Thingiverse um, shown in the link below, and I remeshed it. I'm going to show you guys really quick which program I used. I used Instant Meshes right here. This is an awesome uh, tool. So make sure and download that if you're going to be prepping models. And what I did was I remeshed the file to generate uh, new polygons and new, new topology, basically. So the shape of the grunt didn't change, but the polygons to define that shape did change because they were really jacked up. Um, and then after I had the remeshed model, I pop that into Blender, um, hooked it up to a rig so that I could pose it, or an armature, and then I posed this grunt in different poses so I could print him in, in various poses. Um, and after I remeshed him, I didn't have any problems, so we're going to get into the supports here next. Okay guys, so we're going to show you now how to generate supports. Before that, I'm going to show you some real basic stuff. So the view, the options for the view are right here. This is the display mode. These little guys just indicate different view directions, but right now I want the perspective view, which allows me to tumble and move the camera wherever I want. And this little drop down here changes the display. So if we change it to wireframe, this is the wireframe mesh. Um, filled wireframe shows the wireframe on top of the solid view. So you can kind of see the shape and the topology if there's a problem. And then transparent shows them transparent because sometimes we're going to hollow out models and we're going to do that later. But when you hollow out the model, it basically means that you don't waste resin and makes it printable. Because if you print something super thick, you're going to have problems. But we'll get into that in a minute. So most of the time, we'll just leave it on shaded mesh. When you import a model into Photocentric Studio, you should see red underneath here on the bottom. If you don't, go down here in the corner and check. Make sure this little checkbox is checked. If we turn this off, they disappear, so turn that on. Make sure this one down here is turned on. I'll tell you what that is in a minute. That's critical support areas. Oh, actually it won't turn on yet, but I'll show you why. Um, and then basically what the red represents is this is um, what's called a critical area or a critical surface. And that means a surface that the angle is such that it needs to be supported, basically. So obviously his face here is hanging off in the middle of nowhere. And because of the angle, the slicing software says, hey, you might want to check this out because there's nothing here. So when the printer gets up here, there's nothing to support this. So that's called a critical area or a critical surface. You'll notice underneath his shoulders here, it's orange because that's getting to critical, but they do actually print just fine. Um, I think my critical angle is set to 25 degrees, which is pretty realistic. Some people have it set to 30, but I set mine to 25. Um, and to, in order to generate supports for a model in here, you have to click support mode over here. Um, so we're going to click support mode. For some reason, it changes the view. I don't know why, but once you're in here, it doesn't do it again. I'm going to show you guys how this works by, uh, sorry, this is generating all the supports here. So this is your density of your supports, which is 35% uh, tip diameter. This is the diameter where it contacts the model. I have it set to 0.9, so it doesn't break. Um, every resin is going to be slightly different for these settings, but I'm using uh, translucent resin right now, the translucent red photocentric resin and hard. Um, the critical build angle I do have set at 25 degrees. Um, this is your sampling strategy. I have it set for surfaces only. You can change this to creases and surfaces, creases only. Um, and then surface sampling here is how it how it's supposed to sample or basically look for areas that need support. I have it set to be grid because random sometimes misses things. So 
Um, your strategy here, this is one of the most awesome parts of the whole program, is called um, split style scaffolding. So normally you would have single sports only, which means every sport has its own base or leg. And sometimes you would use lattice support for large prints. And I'm going to show you what this is real quick, just so you guys get an idea what this does. Okay, so this is set to single supports only. So you can see that each support is, just like it says, independent of the other supports. They're all single. But the problem is, if you were to leave a support like this under the nose that's really this tall, this is only about one and a half millimeters wide here, this little pole. So at some point during the print, this will most likely break, which means that when it gets up here to the nose, your nose and face are not going to print because there's no support there anymore. Um, which is where the cool part of this option comes in, and that is when you change this to split style scaffolding. Let me click this again. Um, hold on, I'm going to turn up the percentage here a little bit, make it go a little more uh, crazy. I'm going to bump this all the way up to 70% so I can get some more supports to show you guys. Okay, so you can see over here. See how the supports are cross-connected or interconnected? And you can see for the hand here as well that it interconnects the different supports. And what that does is it makes them stronger. On the back here, you can see it's interconnected supports as well. Um, this guy right here is interconnected between the other two. By connecting them, it makes all of them stronger because they're no longer a, uh, a single pole just sticking off the platform. They're connected to each other. So it's almost like a lattice. Um, so what I would normally do is the first thing you want to do is orient this model, right? So the orientation would be the most important before we start generating support. So I'm going to delete these supports real quick. And we're going to go into a little bit of theory here now that I've showed you the basics of the support settings. And that is that you want to make sure that the model is oriented before you start supporting. And that is because all your supports are going to change if the orientation changes. So the program here has identified critical build surface angles, but it doesn't tell us um, what things are, are islands. And an island is something like the nose out here. Okay, so this area right here, this part of the mouth and this part of the gas mask here, these are islands because there's nothing under them. So the print progresses from down here upward in layers, and when it gets up here, there's nothing here. So this would be considered an island. The same thing with the fingertips. All of these fingertips and the hand, or not necessarily the entire hand, but the fingertips, the end of them are all islands because there's nothing under them. There's, there's no way for them to contact the build plate. And remember, the, the platform is printing from the bottom up, so it's printing here this direction. So if we use this slider right here, this is a slider that shows the layers. This is how the print is going to progress. It's going to start at the feet, and as the printer prints, it's going to print up or away from the platform. So you can see it's printing up through the feet and it gets to the legs, but you can see all the fingertips here. If we scroll down to right about here, all of these fingertips just start printing in the middle of nowhere. So all of the fingers are islands and you can also see that his hips right here in the middle of his uh, legs or his pelvis, this is also an island because it prints in the middle of nowhere. So you want to identify the orientation of your model that has the least amount of islands and it also has the least amount of critical build angle surfaces. So right now we have very little critical build angle surfaces actually. If you look for the red areas, they're very small um, except for the feet here. And the feet don't matter because the feet are going to be on the platform itself. They're going to be touching the platform. So we don't care about the feet. So this orientation of the model is actually really good. Now I'm going to show you a poor orientation here just as a quick example. We're going to go to rotate. Now we've got to select the model first. We're going to go to rotate, and we're just going to rotate it upside down, right? Because this is a pretty bad orientation, but we're just going to do this to show you. And now when we look, see all the red areas? This would be a bad way to print it because all of these surfaces here, you can see, 
they're within that 25 degree angle limit from horizontal, which means that these are all going to need supports. All of these red areas are going to need supports so that they don't break and so that there's something to support them as they print, right? And not only did we generate a bunch of critical surfaces now by putting it in the wrong orientation, but we also made a lot more islands because the shoulders are not islands. They're sticking off in the middle of nowhere. The arms, the arms are islands. Um, basically everything on this model would be an island because his head is not flat. So now we've got an island for the head. We've got an island for the back of his um, body here, the horn. So you can kind of see that the orientation is important. And Photocentric Studio has an auto orient. So if we go in here up to the top where it says auto orientation, we click on this. We can set the algorithm and we could tell the software to basically orient this model to be optimum for a certain criteria. And right here it says the minimum amount of surface under the critical print angle, the minimum print time, and as many items as possible on the build platform. So in most cases, we want the minimum amount of surface under the critical print angle, right? So I've set this to 200 iterations. Um, the height of the platform I'm going to set to zero because I don't want it bumping it above the platform. And here's my critical angle. And I'm just going to hit auto orient. And it's going to burn through a couple iterations and say, OK, here's the best spot to put the bottle for the least amount of um, critical surface area. So I'm going to show you right now what happened. So it oriented everything here and what it considered, mathematically at least, to be the least amount of critical surface area. I have to admit it looks pretty good. There isn't much red here if you look on the bottom of his head and his shoulders. But there's only one problem with this auto-orient algorithm, and that is it doesn't calculate for islands. So while we do have minimal um, critical angles, and this is ideal because our arms and legs are going upward, which means that as the print progresses, I'm going to show you real quick here, as the print progresses up through the body, the arms will automatically support themselves because they're at an angle. So in other words, this part right here just keeps printing up on itself. You don't have to generate any supports for it. That's ideal, actually, for an SLA print. But the problem is the print's going to take longer now because the way the computer has oriented it, it's taller. So from the edge of the feet here down to the horn, he's taller a little bit. So it's going to take another half an hour, hour to print this. Um, and the other problem is it doesn't calculate, like I was saying, islands. So if we look now, we have more islands than we had before because of all the shoulders, the head, um, and this little knuckle here on the top of the arms. That's going to be an island, so we've got to put a support under that. So the algorithm itself is very good, but hopefully in the future they put something in there that allows the, um, the islands and the critical angle to be considered um, together when it's orienting. But still still like the software. Um, I'm going to undo that orientation because I want it to be upright. I'm just using Control Z right now. Uh, there we go. So here we have the model reset again. Um, now you know about islands and critical surface areas, which are very important for any print. So we're going to get into the nitty gritty of the supports and how to place them, how to edit them, how to put cost, custom supports, um, and so on. So I know you guys probably want to see the end of the video where the actual printing happens and everyone wants to see the results. But if you don't get this part right, you'll never get a print that succeeds. So I would highly recommend continue watching this video. OK, guys, so now that we went over the basics and I showed you about islands and critical surface angles, um, this little button I was showing you earlier puts a green, kind of like a look at me dot, on all of the islands on the model that the computer identifies. So obviously his feet are islands because it doesn't calculate that, hey, this guy's actually sitting on the platform. But nevertheless, you can see each of his fingertips now has a green, a uh, little green circle placed on it or a little uh, ball. And that signifies that the computer algorithm is telling you, hey, this is an island. There's nothing supporting this, so you better put a support here. So you can see that even though this finger doesn't really have that much critical angle because it's the end of the fingertip is rounded, this is still considered an island because there's nothing supporting the finger. So it's kind of useful to turn this on when you're first learning to do this. After a while, you learn to identify islands you know, just by looking at the model because you realize there's nothing there. But when you're first getting started, or even if you're just doing a lot of models and you want to get it 
get through fast, just turn this feature on because it's actually very helpful. You can see under the under the mouth and gas mask, it's put an island uh, marker on all of these different points to tell us, hey, you better put something here because it ain't gonna print. So that's a really nice feature. Um, we're gonna go here into the supports. Um, and before we go into the support mode, I'm gonna show you guys something else really quick. And that is hollowing out the model. When we generate supports, putting supports on the outside of the arms and legs and all this so that it prints is great. But the problem is the middle of this grunt is just too thick. So if we scale up here to about here, let's say, right? That's a lot of surface area for an SLA printer. Um, that's probably, I don't know, maybe 30, 40, 50 uh, square millimeters in surface area. And what that means is it's going to pull really hard on the VAT film when it's trying to peel it off every layer. And not only will this be hard on the mechanics of the printer, but it's going to waste more resin. And we don't really need the middle of this grunt to be solid because it's just a... Uh, you know, a miniature. We're going to set it on a shelf, we're going to paint it, play with it, look at it, but it doesn't need to be super strong. So what you want to do with most of your models is hollow them out before you support them because you're going to need supports inside the model as well. And I know some of you are going, what? Why would you need supports inside the model? And that's because the internal shape is also going to have islands, overhangs, and critical angles as well as the outside, which means that you'll need supports on the inside to make sure it doesn't fail as well. Um, and this might see, seem a little complicated, but it is necessary in understanding how SLA prints work and how they function during the print. So once again, um, awesome tools in Photocentric Studio are right here in the top. You have to be in support mode for these tools to show up. So if you don't see these tools up here showing up and they're grayed out, that's because you're not in support mode over here. So make sure you're in support mode first. And then we're going to go up here, we're going to click this, it says hollow mesh. And we're going to set our wall thickness to one and a half millimeters. And I found this is a good this is a good setting. It makes them thick enough to not just break during the print, but it doesn't waste resin. If you make them way too thin, they're going to be too fragile and they're going to break. If you make them too thick, um, you're just going to waste resin. So I'm going to set the resolution here to 100, um, 100 percent. But down here, I'm going to say reduce the mesh. So I don't know exactly what this is here. I guess this is if you wanted the uh, resolution calculations to be more accurate, but I've never found a need to change it. So what I do go is I go down here and I say mesh reduce, I check this off, and I pull this up to about 60 or 70%. I'm gonna leave this at 70%. And what this does is it says, we don't need, let's look at the bottom of the screen here. I'll show you guys in a second. I'm gonna click on hollow first. And one thing I didn't mention is if you guys are using this Photocentric Studio on the computer or laptop you're using to print, make sure you have at least an i5 or an i7 because these functions in here that edit the meshes, it's a lot of number crunching. So you need a fairly fast processor. And for the interface and all the drawing, you also need an up-to-date graphic card. So don't use an old computer for this. It won't work very well. OK, so you can't tell it's hollow yet. But we're going to show you right now. I was trying to get you a vertex count here when we click on it. Uh... Okay, guys, here's what I was looking for. So, number of faces here. See the number of faces in this grunt? Um, 319,000 faces just for that one grunt. Um, and the number of vertices down here was 159,000. So think if you have 319,000 faces and you're trying to hollow it out, you don't need that many faces for the inner hollow mesh um, because it's just unnecessary. These details on the outside of the arms we need because these are going to show up in the print. On the inside of the mesh, it doesn't matter because you never see it. It's hollow. So when we did this hollow function and we pulled this up to 70%, this basically said, I want to delete 70% of those 320,000 faces from the internal mesh, which basically simplifies it. So we don't need to do this because we've already done it. But now when we go up here and we switch this to transparent, if you look carefully as we tumble the view, you can see the inside of the grunt now. You can see that this slightly uh, more opaque section here. 
that's the internal mesh. And then if you want to make it even look cooler, you can scroll through the layers and it's going to show you the inside. So now we can see that this red section here is where it's going to use resin to print his shape, but the inside is going to be hollow. Same with his arms here. We didn't need to waste resin for his arms. So you can see as you scroll up to the model where it's hollow and where it's not. So now that we've hollowed the grunt out, and we went back to the solid display mode. You can still see he's hollow when we scroll. Now we can go actually do our real um, support generation. So normally what I would do is I would leave this low at about 30%, right? I'm going to click generate, make sure everything here is set the way I want it. You guys can kind of take note of these values. These are my values for um, how thick the poles should be. Um, where they should be spaced out, um, internal supports is enabled, turn this on, you're going to need the internal supports, remember. I have absolute foot sizes, which means that this little foot at the base here doesn't change. Um, so just kind of look at these values, and you can copy them if you want, if you like them, if not, just change them to your liking. And you can see there's not really enough supports here, and some of the islands have no supports at all, so for example right here there's no supports. But the important thing is the ability to edit the automatic supports within Photocentric Studio. This is one of the uh, most powerful parts of the whole program. And that is, we can just go in here and start clicking all over the model and it will auto-generate supports wherever we click, but it will also connect. Remember we showed you the split style scaffolding. It's gonna interconnect all of those supports it generates in addition to placing them where we want them. So that's one of the best features of the whole program. So we're gonna go in here and edit. This is how I would normally support this. I'm going to click Edit Points. And what you should see when you get in here, if you have a fairly new graphic card, is you're going to see these little black circles or dots everywhere. And we're going to turn off the green ones at the moment so they're not confusing you. But you can see everywhere you see one of those little black discs, that's a support point or where we want a support to connect. And I'm going to turn this one here. If you want to get rid of these auto supports, you can just click on them. So I'm just going to left click on this one up here under the gas mask because I don't want the supports for the face. I don't want these supports to go all the way down to the platform. I'm going to show you guys a better way to do this. So for now we're just going to remove it. And what we're going to do instead is we're going to go click all the areas where we're going to need support. So the tip of every finger, we're just going to click it. Bam! You see the little disc appearing. We're going to get a support there. I'm going to put one right here and I'll put another one here inside the hand. We've already got one on the, the back of the hand here where the arm is. Um, do the same thing on this one over here. Click on each fingertip. Put one in the hand, put one right here. Um, looking pretty good. We don't need this guy here. He's kind of off center a little bit. Now you can see this little part here on the back protrudes out. And I don't think this will be a problem printing. I know it's tagged it as critical. But when you look here from the side, the angle's not really that crazy. This will actually successfully print because it's so small. If this was larger, it might fail, but we're going to ignore that. But we're going to make sure we get an island here because if we don't get something under his pelvis here, we're going to have some issues. Um, so we're just going to put a support here, another one here, and then I'm going to place one here and here on each leg to make sure his legs don't fail because when you look from this direction, you can tell the legs are almost horizontal, so we need something under there to make sure that's stable when it's printing. So now that I've got the supports where I want them, right, and I kind of ignored the head up here, but we'll show you why in a minute. These are going to be the most important supports. I am going to place one here, one here, and one here. Just kind of, I, I notice I kind of randomly spaced them. You don't want them perfectly spaced. Um, for some reason, random is a little bit stronger when the print's progressing. So now that we've got them all where we want, this is the cool part. All you have to do is hit enter, or you can click apply up here, but I'm just going to hit enter. And it's going to generate those auto supports where I told it to. So notice now that we have supports generated in only the places that we wanted them. And on top of that, it connected them all together. So you can see that these ones under the hand. These normally, if you were printing up through this hand, I'm going to show you real quick here. If you were printing up through the fingers, right? See, the fingers have already started over here. 
look at this right hand right here. So right here we see the fingertips starting, and this time they're starting on supports because we put a support under the fingertips. But when it gets up into the hand here, the hand is pretty big. So if the peel force here, let me show you real quick. If the force on this surface right here is too great, it's going to start breaking these supports down here, and the hand's going to break off, and you won't have any arm on this side of the grunt, so it's basically going to fail. You'll be lucky if the torso prints with no arm connected, because sometimes interconnected things mess up other things. Um, but basically, you see all the area there on that arm as it goes up through, and if we hadn't hollowed it, there'd be even more. But we want to make sure that these supports down here are strong enough to actually hold that arm in place and not break during the print. And that's why I like that interconnected lattice. As you can see, it's connected all of these different lattices and these support points together. If they were individual arms, they would almost certainly break and it would be a print failure. So You can also see here um, that it's placed an internal support inside the body. And if we scroll up through, this was something that was auto-generated. I didn't generate that. Um, you can see it's supporting that angle because these angles right here in his shoulders, let's see if I can show you guys this, click on it, and tip the view like this, and you guys see right here, see how this white part of the model and you see it turn orange here? This is a critical angle, but it's on the inside of the model. So it's trying to support that critical angle because when it comes up here over his shoulder, it starts printing almost horizontally. And if you don't put something under something like that, it's going to fail as well. So if that little section right there is not supported, you end up with a hole in the print. And then from here on, it's over. Your print's done. So the bottom part will look great, and the top won't be there. Um, so now that we showed you how to generate auto supports um, and then customize them and edit them, Let's suppose that we just finished the auto supports and we're looking at this and we're like, man, you know what? I don't need one of these supports. So let's say, let's say this support here, right? This support on the inside of the hand here. If I don't like this support in here, this one that contacts right here, this is looking a little too busy here. So I don't like this. So what we're going to do is we're going to hit edit again. We're going to go in here again because Remember, everything here is dynamic, so nothing changed. We're just going to click on this disk to get rid of it. Um, sorry, there we go. And then we're just going to hit Apply again. And when it regenerates the support structure, that support won't be there. Now you can see it looks a little bit less busy, and it'll probably be a better idea to keep that one out of there. There's a little too many supports in that one spot. So the other thing I didn't show you yet is you can move these supports around. So when you click on a joint, the joint will give you options to move the support. Um, and it also gives you options to change some of the dimensions of the support. So let's say this section right here, I don't like the way it's connecting. I think this is too tiny and it might break. I can go up here and change the diameter that it touches the model. Now watch when I change this to two. If I, if I hit enter, and then I go down here and I hit apply, notice how every contact point on the model is now ginormous because these were all auto-generated supports. So even though it says apply to selection, then you see it says in parentheses one, um, it doesn't really quite work the way it's supposed to in that it goes to all the auto supports. So we're gonna change this back to 0 0.9. But later on, I'm gonna show you when you put manual supports on the model, um, it does work because it's only gonna apply it to the support that you have selected. So I'm just left-clicking supports here. Now this is where it gets even cooler is I've now auto-generated supports where I want them. They're all nice and strong, but I don't like the placement of this one. It looks a little weird here. So I'm just gonna click on it, and I'm just gonna move it. So we're gonna click on the bottom here so that we can move the whole column. I'm just gonna click on the y-axis here, and I'm just gonna drag the whole thing over here. All right? And I'm gonna select this because it's kind of sticking out here in the middle of nowhere, and I'm gonna drag it underneath the hand more. So I basically just repositioned the support, but if you notice, the contact points never moved. They stayed in the same spot. So we can sit here and we can customize these supports to our heart's content, drag them all over the place, change the size, you name it. You can almost do anything, and the contact points will continue to stay there. This doesn't look too terrible. It's not great. 
Um, I don't like this point here. See how this angle is kind of crazy? It's better if it's more vertical. So I'm going to move this point down. I'm just going to drag it down with the z-axis to here. And then this guy, I'm just going to bring it over like this. Drag it down like so. And now you can see it's a little bit less drastic and it lines up better. That'll be a lot better set up there. Um, this hip area looks good. This should be no problem, no drama. Um, so at this point, we're looking pretty good. Now I'm going to show you guys how to place your own supports um, in addition to the auto-generated supports. So here we are in the auto panel, right? And this is all the settings for auto. But you can also generate your own supports. And I've already saved profiles for this. So I'm going to show you really quick here. Go to configuration. We're going to go to machines, liquid crystal 2, which is the machine we have. And we're going to go to supports. And you're going to notice here that it has different types of supports. Single, lattice, tree, internal, internal base support, in, or sorry, internal tree support, base support, auto-generated split lattice, drainage hole, and base connector. So auto-generated split lattice, these are going to be your default settings um, for that split lattice that it auto-generates. You can see in here I have all my diameters set up so that every time I generate auto lattice, it uses these values. Um, but over here, let's say I want to go place my own single support later. It shows you a preview of the support, how it's going to look, kind of. And you can set all the values. Here's the contact diameter, the diameter for the first joint, the diameter of the pole at the base, how wide the base is going to be, how thick the base is going to be. So all of this stuff is customizable, and you can save it. And then that way, when you go back, this is for the lattice, this is for the tree support. And I have edited these values. So just to kind of take a look here at the tree support, um, the internal tree support. Kind of take a note of the values because I bumped them up and made it. I think the ones in the default software are just super big and clunky. And for small stuff like miniatures, you don't need them that thick. So we're going to go ahead and close this now because we don't need it. And then you can notice how it kicked me out of support mode. So see how everything's grayed out up here once I went into the settings. So I got to click support mode again. And now if I move around here, um, I'm going to go put some supports under the gas mask here. But remember I said earlier we don't want supports coming up from the platform because they're going to be too weak and we're going to waste resin. So what we're going to do is we're going to put what's called an internal support. And basically an internal support doesn't have to be inside the model. It's just going to be a support that is starting on the model, not the platform. So it's not going to be inside the model itself, but it's going to be starting on the surface of the model instead of the surface of the platform. And by the way, the view mode for the supports is right here. If you were to click this, it changes from solid to point line to point. So it basically changes how you're viewing the supports. The supports themselves never change, but the way you're viewing them does change if you change these little buttons right here. Okay, guys, so we're going to click on um, internal tree support. Make sure you don't click on tree support, so click on internal tree support. This is telling the, the software that we want to add a support that starts on the model. So we're going to click here to put the base. Click here for a contact, here for a contact, and here for another contact point. And when we click enter, it has generated a tree, right, with support branches wherever we clicked. So the lowest contact point that we clicked on first is going to be the base of the tree. We could have clicked them in any order. But whatever is the lowest one in Z height is going to be the base. So see, now that we've placed a support under his face, when the print is going up through here, this will have no problem printing off of his chest and supporting the gas mask. And we didn't waste a bunch of resin and risk a failed print by printing all the way from the platform all the way up to his face. So this is ideal when you have areas that overhang other areas. Is use internal supports to support them. We're going to go ahead and add another internal tree. So we're going to click. Click again, put one here, here, here. We're going to put a fourth one here just in case. And see, now we've got plenty of supports here for his face so that it doesn't fail. I want this to be a little over to the right, so I'm going to drag it over just so it's a little bit stronger on the right side. And I'm going to drag it a little bit to the back so that it's not quite so far out there. There we go. Remember, all this stuff is editable. And let's say I don't like this support here, right? But everything else is good. I can just hit delete and boom, that part of the support is gone. So 
it's very easy to edit supports. <coughs> um, now that we've supported his face, the only thing else you might want to do is put a support under his armpits here. So what we're going to do is we're going to look right here. Once again, we're going to use the internal supports. And let me show you guys something else that's kind of cool. A tree support is a support that starts out at a trunk or a base and it branches out. But if we use the internal support function here, this is also an internal style support, but notice how it looks like an upside down Y. This support gives us the option to have two base supports that merge into one contact point, which in some cases is better because for the shoulder, it's kind of far above the knee and we don't want this support breaking. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put a support here and a click there and a click right here. And then I'm gonna go up here and click under the shoulder like this and I'll show you guys here. See how it generated an upside down Y? So basically what we did is we ensured that the bottom portion of the support right here is a little bit stronger so that way as the print goes all the way up here to the shoulder it doesn't break on the way up. And once again we can edit this so I'm going to edit this to be a little stronger. I'm going to center this, pull it up in Z height, center it again about right there. And you can see now when that prints there's really no risk of it breaking because of the geometry and the shape. So we just supported the shoulder without wasting a bunch of resin once again coming from the platform. So we're going to do the same thing on the left side. So we're going to click on internal support. Pop one here, one here, and one there. Hit enter. We'll do the same thing again. We'll edit this angle a little bit here because it's not... When you have a long section like this coming off at a kind of a a semi-vertical angle, you're asking for it to break, so I'm going to straighten it up a little bit. And that's it. This was not a super complex model, but it taught you guys the basics of supports, where they should be, um, how to edit them, move them, customize them. Um, the one thing I should note at this point is, now that we've added these custom supports, um, namely these internal supports under the shoulders and the gas mask, if we were to go over here and click on support generation, right? If you go in here and you click edit points now, it is going to remove the manual supports that you have added. Um, to my knowledge, there's no way to save them unless you were to save them as an as an external file and then re-import them. Um, so in other words, you would have to select these supports and somehow export them without exporting the rest of it. But for the simplicity of it, that's why we did the automatic supports first. Because if I accidentally go in here and go, man, I really don't like this angle right here. And I don't want this contact point anymore. I could just click on it and delete it right from right here. But let's say there was something I couldn't fix. And I go, oh, you know what? See this point here where it crosses this other support? This is going to cause a disaster. If I go in here and click on the edit points, I can go fix that. But the problem is when I come back, all of my manual supports will have disappeared. So always do your auto support generation first, get that nice and squared up, and then go back and fine tune all of your manual supports second. So basically at this point, we're done with the outside of the grunt. This will be a great successful print, except for one thing. We haven't supported the inside yet. So now comes the really fun part, and I'll let you know the basics. And that is we've got to scroll up through this model, and we've got to find any points on the inside that are going to be islands. And as we go up through this, you can kind of see on the torso, everything kind of just smoothly, you know, gets larger, gets smaller. But as we move up here through the torso, remember we were talking earlier about the shoulders. I'll show you right here. We're going to have multiple problem areas. So I'm just going to literally delete this because we don't want this one in here anymore. So we're just going to click on the different segments here and delete them and make sure we get this tip down here okay so now that we've deleted that little auto support we didn't like I'm going to show you something here with the face so when you, when you go up through the face here notice how the face connects to the body right there you can see it connecting right here this little median and then as we go up through here the head is hollow, right? And so is the neck. But right here, see this point right here? This is where the neck is going to join together. 
um, and form the back of the neck and the top of the head. But we need to make sure that there's something supporting that because when you have an angle like that, you can see as it, you scroll up through here, it kind of just shoots across at a horizontal angle and connects. It might survive, but we don't want to take a chance because if it fails, our whole print fails, you know, as well. So good idea not to take a chance. So what we're going to do is we're going to use that internal support we showed you earlier. I'm going to click on it. I'm going to put two legs right here, left and right. And then this is actually pretty cool the way this works. We can't look upside down from the model and slice it at the same time, but we don't need to. All we need to do is pull this up right here until it just connects like this. And then when we click here, the program is still going to register that we were clicking on the bottom of that surface, not the top, right? Because this is part of the inside of the, the actual plastic or the print. So you can see it put a contact point right here, even though we were looking from the top. And when we hit enter, it's going to add a support there. So the only thing I don't like about the support is for some reason it put this union uh, section the wrong place here. It's way too far forward. So we're going to move that. In case I can select it. We're going to move that section forward so that it's underneath it like it should be. And there we go. Now we don't have to worry anymore about the neck. So when we go up here, the only thing we have to worry about now is these shoulders that I was showing you earlier where it kind of comes over. So if you watch this area right here, as we scroll up through the, the different layers, you can see how it just kind of zooms over there. We're going to support both the shoulders so they don't collapse. So starting right here, we're going to, we're actually going to use the tree support this time. So we're going to use the internal tree support. And we're, the tree support member has one base, but it allows multiple contact points or fingers. We're going to click here. And then as we scroll up through the model like this, we're going to put one, two, three, in a triangle kind of. And that way, as that shoulder prints, now you can see there's three little fingers sticking up there. When that shoulder does its little crazy uh, thing and comes over, it won't fail because we've supported it correctly. Um, and of course, you would do the same thing on this other side. We're not going to do it now just to save time. But um, So we'll keep scrolling up through the model here. Looking good, looking good. Um, Right here, you can see this joined together. This probably won't be any problem because it's so close together, so I'm going to ignore that. Um, yeah, and it looks pretty good from there on out. These, these little sections here in the torso and the head, as long as the ratio that they're closing at or the rate is reasonable, then you know it's not going to be a super horizontal surface. But if you see something, let's say, go from here and then all of a sudden jump over to here, then that's probably going to be something that needs supported. So, But the one thing I didn't show you yet is you have to put holes in this hollow mesh. So the mesh is hollow, but if we go here to the transparent view, there's going to be liquid resin inside the body here. There's no way for that resin to get out unless we put a hole there. So what you want to do very last, after you put all your supports, is you want to go around and place holes. So we're going to go to solid mode, actually, because I kind of know what I'm looking for. Actually, you know what? We'll leave it on transparent just so it's easier. But we're going to go back to support mode, right? And you're going to go up here and you're going to click on uh, this button here. This generates a hole, but it doesn't generate a hole in the mesh right away. It only generates the hole itself when you go over here and click slice. If you use this button here, it actually performs a Boolean operation and puts a hole in your mesh right there. But if you save the file and come back, there's no way to undo that hole. The hole's there forever. So in, in the case where you're going to slice it here in Photocentric, it's probably better to keep this one because there's no point in putting a permanent hole that can't be undone. So the way a hole is going to work is turn on shaded here. Remember this model is printing from the base up, right? So it's starting down here and printing up. You want a hole at the bottom of every cavity. So you can see right here where the torso starts printing. Watch right here. We start getting a cavity in the torso. So where we are is actually, we're down at the bottom of the resin tank looking up as the part prints. So there's going to be some air in here. And what happens is when it goes to peel this part off the platform, there's no ways for air to enter this cavity or exit. 
So when it goes to peel off, imagine it's a suction cup. It's trying to pull this suction cup right here off the vat film, which is going horizontal here. And if you don't put a hole at the bottom of that cavity, it's going to break your model. Because at some point, remember we were talking earlier about the area of these arms versus the supports holding them? This vacuum, uh, this little uh, air pocket in here, this vacuum, is going to generate enough suction, once again, think a suction cup, to where it's going gonna, it's gonna to break these supports holding the arms. And the same with the torso. It'll either break the model or it'll break the supports. So we don't want that. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, OK, where's the bottom of this cavity? It's going to be down here near the bottom of the model. So we're going to go click on our, on our drain. And once again, this is editable, but I have mine set to two millimeters. So I'm going to click right here, and I'm going to put a drain right here in his butt. Right? And I'm just going to hit enter because I'm done. And you can see what that's done is it's put a hole right here in the very bottom. So yes, right here where the cavity first starts, there won't be any way to drain it. And I could move it down or delete it if I don't like it. But the point is, as close to the bottom as possible, you want a drain hole. And I'm going to put a permanent hole here just to show you guys something. So I'm going to put a permanent one right there. OK. And you can see it's put an actual hole in the model. But now, when this model is printing, when it gets to this point right here, right there, you can see now we have a passage for air. So air can be pulled into this cavity as it peels off the film, and it won't create any suction. And that's what we want, because as it progresses up through the torso here, we won't be ripping at the torso with all of the, uh, the difference in air pressure. So we need to put a drain hole. I'm going to go, go ahead and undo that hole. I'm going to go ahead and put drain holes in every cavity because we have multiple cavities in the model. So we've got a cavity for the torso and the head, which are basically joined together because you can see right there the neck joins into the head. So we have one for the body, one for each arm, and then we have another cavity for each leg. And they're all separate. So I'm going to go place a drain hole for each of the cavities. And obviously, where you place these drains is somewhat optional. I'm going to put them here on the inside of the leg so they're not super obvious, because we don't want a big, obvious drain hole on the outside of the leg. It's going to make it look ugly. And obviously, later on, you could come in here with um, some kind of putty and fill these in after the print's done, and you'll probably never know. But the point is, we want to put them in a not too visible position. So we've got our legs there. I'm going to go ahead and pop one into the bottom of the torso right here. I don't want it to interfere with the, with the support points. So notice I gave a little space for the supports. Um, and then we've got the arms to deal with. So let's go right here. Probably the inside of the hand is the best. We'll put one right here on the inside of the hand because there's no supports there. OK, that looks good. Then we'll go over here. And we'll put another one on inside of this hand. Now this one we have a support, so I'm going to try and place this one. I'm going to put a little more arm on here. I'm going to try and put this one. Uh, I can't really get this one good in the, into the inside, so we're going to place it on the back here. I'm going to put it right here into the back. And I'm going to double check on the inside to make sure it didn't go crazy. Eh, it should work. There's no guarantee that'll be a clean slice, but we can we can slice it and see what happens. But now we should be pretty much good to go, because now all of our cavities or hollow spaces have a drain. And once again, we place the drain at the bottom of those cavities. Um, and the only other thing I've learned to do is the inside of the torso here is hard to get liquid to drain out of this hole when it's all done, because there's nowhere for more air to enter as the resin exits. So we're going to put a second hole into the torso. And the reason for that is just to allow air to enter so that the resin can freely flow out and we don't have to sit there and jiggle it all over the place. Because remember, this whole thing is really tiny and this is a two millimeter hole. So it looks large here, but it's not. So I'm going to put a hole right here in the, in the body. And now, now when the print's done, air can enter into this hole 
and drain out this hole, no problem. So we can get the extra resin out of the uh, out of the model before we cure it.